All right, so welcome to all our attendees to our third um, Education, Humanities and Social Sciences webinar. Um, I'm delighted to say that we've got um, two experts on South American politics today. Um, and um, first of all, though, I just want to say I'm sure that most of you already know this, the attendees who are here. But the Faculty of Education, Humanities and Social Sciences um, runs courses in liberal arts, in um, politics, theology, humanities, um, education, teacher training, um, as well as um, business and international business management studies, as well as a range of um, MA courses. Um, in particular, Dr. Chris Wald's own MA in politics and international relations, um, which is very successful. So if you don't know about these, please do go to our website and check them out. Um, so we've got today Dr. Chris Wilde, who's a senior lecturer in the faculty and teaches on politics and international relations, and Dr. Deliani Kirsch, who's an associate lecturer at St. Mary's University, who also teaches on the politics course. So thank you very much to both of you um, for um, coming to do this webinar for us today. Um, First up is Dr. Daniani Kirsch, and she's going to be speaking to us about Fighting for the Right, a functionalist oral history analysis of conservative Brazilian women for military dictatorship, 1964 to 1985, um, to Jairo Bolsonaro's presidency. What we'll do is Daliani is going to speak first, and then I'll introduce Chris, and if you have any questions, then please use the question and answer button at the bottom and um, we'll have time for questions at the end of the um, webinar. Okay, passing over now to Daliani. Hi everyone, uh, good afternoon. First of all, apologies because I only saw the title of the mini seminar today and it's on the political economy of South America and my paper's not really on the political economy. Uh, so fighting for the right is about um, functionalist theory and how conservative women subconsciously um, kind of depict these characteristics and why it influences their own choices and political mo um, motivations. So I'm going to be looking at two particular periods in Brazilian history. The first one is the build up to the military coup of 1964. And then I'm going to look at the role of conservative women in the election of Jair Bolsonaro in 2018. Oh, okay, I need to press the right button. So uh, let's visit the theoretical framework first, functionalism. Um, so when I was thinking about, you know, as a feminist, what would motivate uh, women to support such kind of misogynistic ideologies, I stumbled across functionalism. Now, functionalism has its origins in the scholarship of Emil Durkheim, who of course was the founding father of sociology. And he argued that uh, Marxism and feminism are conflict theories because they emphasize inequality and social change rather than cohesion to the social order. So within functionalism, these kind of institutions like the nation, the state, the church and the family pay a really kind of crucial role in maintaining social order and society. And Talcott Parkin, a Parsons, who was a prominent sociologist in the 20th century, kind of developed this. And he argued that society exists on the basis of cooperation and consensus based on shared moral codes and um, values. So functionalism was quite in vogue with sociologists until the sexual revolution. However, it was un unable to account for social change and it was somewhat discredited. So Maxime Molyneux has written extensively about um, left-wing revolutionary women's groups in Latin America, and she talks about distinct strategic gender interests. So I've applied her theory to the study of conservative women in this particular case study, because functionist women are more about kind of preserving the patriarchal order rather than overturning it like feminists. So therefore, they're more of a feminine rather than a feminist group. And why are they attracted to right-wing politics? Well, right-wing politics traditionally celebrate their kind of essentialized gender roles as wives and mothers. Um, and they also support these institutions that they hold so dear. Ultimately, conservative women are not a monolithic bloc. They vary very much uh, according to their class backgrounds, their racial backgrounds, and their geographical backgrounds. 
but I'm not going to talk too much about intersectionality today because there's not enough time, but I do discuss this more in my journal article. So let's uh, kind of apply this framework to the case study of Brazil. Now, Brazil was a Portuguese colony, so it's very much influenced by this kind of patriarchal culture, machismo. Macho is a Latin word referring to uh, a type of behavior that men use to keep women in their traditional gender roles. Also, Brazil also has a legacy of military dominance and um, military coups, and it's very much influenced by the traditionally by the Catholic Church, but now we see the evangelical church playing a more prominent role, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. So in 1962, then President João Goulart passed a rather controversial legislation called the Statute of the Married Woman. And this meant that uh, women could obtain paid employment without their husband's permission. They could inherit and they could own property. And also in the dissolution of a relationship, the woman would automatically get custody unless there were kind of extenuating circumstances. So feminism was viewed quite badly in 1960s Brazil. Conservatives saw it as immoral and dangerous. Uh, and the left saw it as anti-feminine and possibility of causing social anarchy. There were also a lot of anxieties about the youth being too subversive and sexually liberal. And this kind of relates to the sexual revolution of the 60s, which I mentioned before. And then we have a picture of a woman burning her bra. I'm not gonna demonstrate. Um, so conservative women in Brazil. So we have to put this within the context of the Cold War. Now, uh, of course, in 1959 was the Cuban Revolution. And it feels quite strange not talking about that because Cuba is my specialist country. But the fact that Cuba was perhaps the most economically and culturally aligned with the United States, yet we could have a Marxist revolution, kind of sent shockwaves through Latin America. And also with the US was very concerned about possible Marxist takeover in Latin America. So the Br Brazilian military mobilized Brazilian women to save the nation from communism. And they did this by also evoking saving the nation, the church, the family and morality. So they really kind of empowered uh, Brazilian women because they celebrated their centralized gender roles as wives, mothers and educators. And they did this employing very careful images and propaganda. An example of this is a quote from a textbook in a school that was published shortly after the coup, where it says, women were the guardian of morality in the home and the primary party responsible for the rearing of patriotic men. So on one hand, this sounds like women were quite manipulated and duped by the military, but in reality, they employed a lot of agency, conservative women, that is. So they organized prayer meetings and propaganda campaigns. Now these were organized by women and led by women. They also pushed for a moral task force. They openly condemned homosexuality and subversive leftists and communist whores, which of course were the feminists. Women also played a really crucial role in the um, 19th of March, 1964 March called the Family for, sorry, for the March of the Family with God and Liberty. Um, and half a million Brazilians took to the streets, uh, protesting, you know, protecting these kind of social values and, and morals which they held so dear. And what's interesting about women, I don't know if you can see in the pictures, not all of them are doing it, but women generally would have the Brazilian flag in one hand and their baby in the other. And this represents, you know, the nation and the family, the two institutions they held most dear. And we can juxtapose this with the traditional image of the kind of Marxist uh, Global South revolutionary. I actually collect these posters where the woman traditionally has the baby in one arm and the, the rifle in the other. So we move on to the next slide. What happened to these women after the coup? Well, second wave feminists resisted the regime and they encountered a great deal of violence. They were purged. Uh, and one of these women is Dilma Rousseff, who later became president of Brazil. She was actually imprisoned and raped during this period. Conservative women, on the other hand, actually supported it and embraced its functionalist doctrine. Uh, Margaret Powers has written extensively about conservative women in Chile supporting the Pinochet dictatorship, but there's virtually nothing written about conservative women in Brazil. So she argues that women gave the moral justification and political legitimacy for the dictatorship to last so long. So I've applied her, her argument to the case study of Brazil because we have 21 years of military rule and that was somewhat supported and embraced by conservative women. So women were no longer mobilized and politically active after the actual return to their traditional roles to rear these kind of patriotic men. 
Um, and the oral history interview. So the first part of this case study today is generally based on a literature review. And then I conducted oral histories for the contemporary case study. So when I interviewed the women who were aged mainly in their late 60s, they were quite young at the time of the coup and the military dictatorship. But we see a lot of nostalgia. Um, they felt that the military had kind of maintained social order in Brazilian society. There was a lot of respect for elders. They felt safe to, to leave their homes. And they felt that family values and gender roles were really celebrated during this period, whereas they're not today. So there, as I said earlier, there was a huge lack of scholarship on conservative women during this period. And I've identified three possible explanations. So the first one is we see a kind of surge in women's movements. And these absorb the more moderate feminists who didn't try and resist the regime and also the conservative women's groups. And their agenda was more looking at, say, maternal health rights or the living conditions of urban women in slums and things like this. The second reason is the most fervent uh, conservative women became involved in international activism. So there's actually an example of a, a delegation that went to the United States. This is actually recorded in uh, Reader's Digest and try to encourage American housewives to resist communist elements in society. They were also really active in the, the coup of the Pinochet, coup in 1971 in Chile, um, and also in the Pinochet regime. And the third women is the, sorry, the third reason is that women became supportive of the dictatorship, the coup and subsequently the dictatorship because of their role in the church, in the Catholic church that is. But once the extent of the violence became more apparent, the Catholic Church somewhat began to distance itself from the military dictatorship. So a lot of women also distanced themselves as well. And a good example of this is the 1968 Wives and Mothers of Brasilia letter. So 122 women who I presume were married to high ranking civil servants, given that Brazil is the, well, it's the actual capital of Brazil, but it's more of a kind of legislative uh, political capital. They wrote a letter to the, the government actually condemning the violence against students, uh, student protests. So again, we don't really know much about conservative women during the, the process of democratization, which began in 1986. I did find a fact, so it's interesting that 40% of the newly elected female members of parliament in 1986 actually came from elitist and well-established political families. So given the link between um, functionism and traditional kind of upper class families, we'd assume they were quite conservative. Also conservative groups splintered after um, democratization. Why? Because race, class and gender were the interests prioritized and these were antithetical to their own particular agenda. So the only time they actually are active is um, protesting against specific proposed legislation like the legalization of same sex marriages or re relaxation of abortion legislation. Let's look at contemporary Brazil. Let me just have some water. So this is where my field work actually begins, where I conducted the oral histories. Um, it's important to note that the Brazilian president, a woman, Dilma Rousseff, was impeached in 2016, and her predecessor, Lula da Silva, was actually arrested in 2017 on corruption charges. And for me, this kind of signifies a crisis of confidence and credibility in democracy and in politics in Brazil. So in 2017, one of the most prominent newspapers in Brazil interviewed people and 78% of Brazilians felt they were not satisfied with democracy. This was also echoed within the oral history testimonies. We kind of see a collective sense of betrayal um, and deception about democracy and the process itself. So the kind of vocabulary that would come up time and time again was cheated, falsely dressed and deception. So this paves the way for a kind of nationalist populist leader who's anti-establishment and not from a political background uh, and this paves the way for Jair Bolsonaro. So he really kind of espouses functionist values. He claims he's going to restore social order. He calls himself a gender crusader. I'm going to talk more about that in the final slide. Um, he believes in the nuclear family, the traditional division of labor. Uh, he claims that domestic violence is something that should be dealt with in the private sphere, not the public sphere. He employs misogynistic rhetoric and he's very critical of feminists and the LGBTQ community. What's also interesting is the evangelical church has really capitalized 
on the kind of anxieties in Brazilian society regarding the decline of the family, homosexuality and sexual promiscuity. So whereas Catholics are more divided and more moderate, evangelicals are more conservative. And they were really active in the campaign okay. against the possible legalization of same-sex marriages in 2011, and also um, the campaign to decriminalize abortion in the case of rape. And by doing this, they've garnered millions of viewers. So in two, sort of viewers, followers, so in 2010, they represented about 21% of Brazilian society. But we find now that in 2020, just you know, 10 years later, they represent about 31% of Brazilian society. So they've really kind of increased their share of followers. And it's also interesting to note that the Ministry of Human Rights that was ironically set up to deal with the legacy, the violent legacy of the dictatorship, has been decommissioned and replaced by Bolsonaro into the, the Ministry of Women, Family and Human Rights to restore family values. And it's headed up by a rather controversial evangelical female pastor called Damaris Alves. So moral panic is a term devised by sociologists in the 1970s to describe a kind of collective sense of fear in society that there's some kind of evil threatening the well-being. Um, and what I've done in this article is I've identified two quite similar anti-modern moral panics. So the first one leading up to the coup is very much concerned about the threat of feminism and socialism. And the second one in 2018 is very concerned about the threat of fourth wave feminism and what they refer to as the PT gender ideology. The is the Partido Trabajadores. This is the Workers' Party, the socialist government that was in power for 16 years between 2002 and 2018. Remember, the two leaders during this period, Lula da Silva and uh, Dilma Rousseff, were discredited by scandals, political scandals. So Marta, who was a 65-year-old cleaner, white cleaner from Fortaleza, I'm not going to read the description of everyone because we don't really have time, but you can see them on the slides. So things started going wrong when Lula started slowly implementing his gender ideology and feminism. Uh, Roberta said, everything is inverted. You just need to look at homosexuality. What was shameful back then is now normal. And what was of pride then is shameful. The world is a mess. Sonia says the PT promoted anti-Christian values. Christ made men and women differently. They're not the same. And Paula said gender and feminism is the destruction of a child's gender identity. Confusing. A boy just can't simply decide to be a girl. So if we juxtapose this kind of the language shameful, anti-Christian, destruction, revolutionary, mess and overpower with this traditional rhetoric um, and vocabulary such as Christ, children, and family and pride, we can see how this really kind of underscores their functionist beliefs, although consciously they're not aware of this theoretical framework. And it's quite similar, the language they evoke to the kind of language used by the conservative women in the 1960s. Although you can really sense a kind of heightened anxiety about the LGBTQ community. So if we look at the corruption scandal, so uh, Stella said the PT corruption represents social decay in society. They took the meat and left the bones. Paola said the previous government diverted money away from the education system, enforcing their corrupt ideals. Renata said when the president is corrupt, it sets a bad example to the rest of the population. In Brazilian history. And Roberta says our biggest concern is the return to everything, how everything was 16 years ago. We must return the dignity of the Brazilian people that Lula and Dilma stole. So as we can see in the testimonies, they don't blame modernity in general. So US culture, rap music, LGBT pride. Um, what they blame is the PT. This is the root cause of corruption in society. And it's quite interesting that Stella and Paola, who were the most moderate conservatives and came from upper middle class backgrounds, whereas they blame the PT as a party, the others use the individual names Lula and Dilma. It's almost like it's personal, and this wasn't the case in the 1960s. We also see a huge sense of social decay in society and setting a bad example. So Paula, Paola even discusses them, you know, diverting money away from education to uh, enforce their corrupt ideals, which presumably are the antithetical ideals to our own functionalist ones. And Stella's metaphor, um, which is the first quote for me, is really interesting. So on one hand, it kind of indicates removing substance. 
taking the meat from the bones, the social decay. But on the other hand, it kind of alludes to physical embellishment, like taking the value away from the nation. Um, and this kind of indicates a kind of confusion or willful ignorance because we have two very distinct political scandals. Whereas Dilma was impeached for budgetary misappropriation, so using the money from the following year to cover um, the deficit, which was actually quite common in Brazilian politics, but she was impeached because she was a target and she was a woman. Lula was more explicitly um, arrested for money laundering and taking a bribe, although I hope he's cleared, even if he did do it, because I think he was the president for Brazil. And uh, his level of corruption is kind of relative compared to the, the culture of corruption in the country. So if we look at the next slide, we look at Jair Bolsonaro, his role and how he resists modernism. So whereas women in the 1960s very much focused on maintaining social order, these current conservative women want to restore this social order and this dignified past which they think has been destroyed. And Bolsonaro, you know, kind of is, is described in messianic terms because he's the defender of these institutions they hold most dear, the nation, the family, the church, etc. So Leila, he represents the hopes of majority. He's a patriot. Stella says Bolsonaro isn't a saint, but it's what we need, someone with a strong arm to lead the country to a safe environment. Roberta says he'll make our country great again. Does that ring any bells or remind you of anyone? Uh, Sonia says his government will help set a good example. And Marta says Bolsonaro is championing the family and setting a good example. So like I said, it's also messianic. He carries the hopes of the nation. He's gonna restore Brazil to its greatness. Um, I think it's interesting that Sonia and Marta both used the phrase good example because we can juxtapose it with the testimonies in the previous slide where they used the word bad example a lot talking about the PT. Um, and then the vocabulary security safe and strong arm is kind of reminiscent of military rule as in the, the military dictatorship. So the final slide uh, is about his role as a gender crusader. He likes to call himself a gender crusader. So Renata says, Bolsonaro shares the values that we women cherish most. He celebrates us as educators, wives, and mothers. Leila says, I don't see him as a misogynist. He's married with a daughter. Sonia says he's appointed lots of female ministers and judges. And Marta says, Bolsonaro pays women the same salaries as men. So Renata's collective pronoun, we and us, for me, suggests how conservative women collectively see Bolsonaro's policies as being in their best interest. And I think Leila's comment about him not being a misogynist is very interesting because unlike anthropologists, we as oral historians um, ask very open style questions. So rather than saying, do you think Bolsonaro is a misogynist? We would say, how do you feel about Bolsonaro? Because we want the participants to talk on their own terms and then we analyze it. So the word misogynist was never mentioned. It came from her. And for me, this highlights the tension in Brazilian society, especially amongst women. There was actually a huge social media campaign called Ellen Now, and I had this Facebook profile, but I had to take it down when I began recruiting women for this, uh, for the interviews. And there are actually millions of women in Brazil, tens of millions of women in Brazil and internationally that protested against him in the run up to his election campaign. Um, it's also interesting that Raghunata and Leila support Bolsonaro in terms of his support for traditional roles, like he's a, you know, he's a wife and a daughter. Um, he celebrates us as wives and mothers. This is kind of reminiscent of the 1960s. But what really shocked me is that Renata and Leila actually support him in second wave feminist terms. He appoints women to political posts and he pays them the same salary. So could it be that uh, functionalist or conservative women have become more moderate over time and they've changed as well? So just to summarize, is an umbrella term in fact varies from person to person and these women who are conservative probably not even aware of this theoretical framework but they share the same ideals uh, the gender case study of brazil illustrates how it's changed over context and time um, and what's interesting is that he's become even more of a controversial and um, kind of figure with the covid 9 pandemic uh, because he's famously said, you know, um, COVID is just a little cold. Currently, Brazil has the 10th biggest death toll in the world, and it's a lot behind the other countries. So 
you know, it could increase. Um, and he's fallen out with some very strategic political allies that have got him into the position of um, president of Brazil, for example, the mayor of Sao Paulo and Rio. And he's fallen out with Sergio Moro, who was the judge that instigated the impeachment campaign against Dilma and the um, arrest of uh, Lula. So he's fallen out with a lot of political allies and a lot of people have turned against him. So it'll be interesting to see if this actually affects his re-election campaign and how people feel about him in Brazil and women included. Um, so that's it, thank you very much. I'll leave, lead you on to Chris. Thank you very much, Daliani. Um, Daliani, could you stop sharing your screen? Brilliant, okay. Yeah. Brilliant. I'm just going to introduce Chris now. So um, our next speaker is Dr. Chris Wilde, and um, he's talking about the Macri administration 2015 to 2019, continuity and change in the political economy of South America. So over to you, Chris. Thank you very much, Kim. So uh, always a tough act to follow, Daliani, and I, I, I'm not quite so polished. I, I don't have a, a series of slides for you. Uh, and I thought when I was sort of writing this talk, rather than just give a sort of potted sort of history of what Macri did and didn't do, uh, I would try to make it a little bit more interesting than that and kind of talk a, a lot more about my work on state theory. So I am going to give you uh, at the end of the talk kind of a, a lot of sort of information and material on the evolution of Macri and the continuity and change between Macri and what came before. But what I wanted to do was to linger on really the reasons why this is important and why this is relevant for understanding the nature of Argentine development trajectories. Uh, and for that, we need uh, a very robust theory of the state. Uh, and I'm also going to do this for, uh, for reasons associated with, with, with COVID and potential future research agendas. And I'll come back to that towards the end as well. But to, to, to begin really with sort of state theory and, 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 and the role of the state in the development process, I kind of begin from, from the, <coughs> the empirical fact uh, uh, that in the context of rapid catch-up industrialization, in the context of catch-up development, the key most influential actor, certainly in the modern period at least, has been the state. As an entity, as, a, as an institution, uh, it has both the capacity and the autonomy to act in ways that shape positive societal change. However, this influence by, by any means has not always been beneficial to development. In fact, in all too many instances, certainly in the Latin American case, it has often been inimical to it. So the state uh, has long, has been a concept that's been long debated in my discipline, in the discipline of politics and political economy and other associated disciplines in, in sociology, etc. And this is because really it's the site of a paradox. On the one hand, it's merely one particular institutional complex amongst many others within any given social formation. But on the other hand, it's peculiarly charged with the overall responsibility of maintaining the cohesion of the social formation of which it is part. So the state on this basis becomes much, much more than its associated ensemble of institutions. Uh, and its form, the, the form, or, or what Bob Jessup would call the uh, strategically selected limits, uh, are constituted and reconstituted through state structures and operating procedures. Uh, it's the outcome of state power, in other words. And this often depends on the changing balance of forces engaged in political action, both within and beyond the state. So what this suggests then is a focus on the institutional context of the state is necessary, uh, but not sufficient in order to analyze the state. So examination of the institutional context of states is something that's traditionally associated in my discipline with what's known as agent-centered institutionalism. It's a very important intellectual tradition for understanding how social forces make history in specific social contexts. Uh, focus is often on complex actors rather than on individuals. Focus is on actors' interests, actors' identities, their orientations, the resources and the specific constellations of uh, 
of, of social relations amongst those actors, rather than looking at generic and context-free terms. Uh, but in addition to this, it's also on the different forms of their interaction. So it's not just about focusing on agents, but it's about focusing on the interaction between agents and the kind of processes of institutionalization that are created as a result. So we have to examine the ensemble of socially embedded, socially regularized, and strategic selective institutions and organizations. This is a necessary element of any analysis of the state. But the problem with agent-centered institutionalism is it, it stops there. This institutional analysis is necessary, but it's not sufficient for understanding the state. If we want to complete our understanding of the state, we have to analyze other substantive aspects of it. It's social bases, it's projects, national popular objectives. When we start looking at these in combination with a sort of agent-centered institutional approach, this framework can generate understanding of all states at all times, albeit fleeting and temporally specific because of their constantly evolving nature. So the policies generated by a particular institutional ensemble of the state and then enacted upon the members of any given social formation or society are done in the name of what has often been referred to as a common interest or a general will. And we have to think about this common interest in general will and how it's politically uh, 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 coalesced uh, rather than just simply looking at the institutions if we really want to get to grips with what the state is. So on this basis, we can try and come up with a pithy definition of the state. I, I, I emphasize the word try. Uh, and Bob Jessup's had a pretty good stab at it. And uh, th this is a quote. I'm going to read this out. The state can be understood as a strategically selective terrain which can never be neutral among all social forces and political projects. But any bias is always tendential and can be undermined or reinforced by appropriate strategies. In other words, it's a condensation of a changing balance of class forces. So this concept has a clear concern for the class character of the state and therefore is often most associated with, with neo-Marxist analysis. I, it postulates that the state has inbuilt biases and these inbuilt biases privilege some agents and their interests over others. But how these biases are actualized depends on the changing balance of forces and their associated strategies and tactics. So it tries to capture the effects of state power as a contingent expression of a changing balance of forces that seek to advance their respective interests inside, through, and sometimes against the state system. Now this changing balance of forces is clearly mediated institutionally, and it's also clearly mediated discursively. So what we need to do if we want to get to grips with what a particular political economy looks like, what a particular associated developmental path looks like, is to look at the changing balance of forces and to seriously and systematically consider the role of the institutions of the state, but not as, a, as, a, as an object in and of itself, in order to understand the underpinning and underlying interests that are being uh, realized. Who is benefiting? And the, the, the chances are that whoever is benefiting is, is, is expressing their power relationships in some way in order to actualize state form in the form of certain institutions. So what I've been doing with a lot of my work is trying to mix these two approaches. Uh, there's lots of problems with agent-centered institutionalism as I've outlined. There's also lots of problems with uh, the neo-Marxist approach, but if we can somehow try and combine these two, I think we're gonna have a very robust theory of the state. So that's what I've been trying to do. So if we, if, we, if we think about this, the state is neither a neutral instrument nor a rational calculating subject. Uh, and we could relate this to kind of, and I'm getting out of my area of expertise now, to like the UK and their constant kind of fetish, fetishization of we are only following the science. As if somehow scientific knowledge in and of itself is neutral and rational, of course it's not. Uh, and even if it were to be in following the science, they are following a certain particular kind of, uh, uh, of, of interest. Uh, now, these, these can be good, these can be bad. That's not really, you know, I leave that for you to decide. I'm just really trying to get to grips with 
how we can understand the expression of power. So if the state is neither a neutral instrument nor a rational calculating subject, uh, what we can realize if we think that it is, 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 is we can critique those ideas for underplaying class. Because these, these mainstream theories treat the state as something that is equally accessible to all social forces and useful for any purpose, which is simply not true. So we can plug a key gap in the mainstream understanding of the state, which in my discipline is grounded in pluralist theory or elite theory, uh, and see class uh, not simply as social groups, but as relational groups. So a further shortcoming of the mainstream pluralist and elite theory approaches uh, is overcome in this approach of combination that I'm trying to, trying to work on, because it sees the state uh, uh, because it overcomes the mainstream understanding of seeing the state as possessing a pre-given unity or pre-given clear purpose. That's simply not true. That purpose, that general will, comes from somewhere. It's political. It's not neutral. The state instead is the crystallization and ongoing metamorphosis of the continuing interaction between structurally inscribed strategic selectivities of the state combined with an institutional ensemble and the changing balance of forces that operate within and at the same time at a distance from the state whilst trying to transform it. So if we develop this understanding, we can think of a number of important observations. The analysis of unequal access to the state for different state agents, I think is the main one. Uh, we can combine with, we, we can use the work of great neo-pluralists like Phil Cerny and talk about how uh, the, uh, the, the shared concern within the changing balance of diverse forces, the shared sensitivity to cross-cutting and intersecting groups and social forces, and the shared focus on conflict, competition, and coalition building. So if we introduce a consideration of the relational aspects of class, rather than simply treating classes as social groups whose relationship with the state is the only ontologically relevant force, we can further improve our understanding of the strategic selectivity of the state itself. Why is the state choosing to act in certain ways but not in others? This is as a result of strategic selection, which I am arguing is ultimately grounded in power relationships between different social groups or classes. This improves our understanding of the strategic selectivity of the state and why it's doing what it's doing. So we can, we can use power even more subtly because neo-pluralists and elite theory to an extent gives equal weight, not ontologically, but analytically, to the structurally inscribed strategic selective asymmetries involved within institutions, institutional orders, and societal configurations. And these, these sort of neo-pluralist theories in particular are less attuned to the specificities of the capital relation especially its inherent structural contradictions, its strategic dilemmas, and the social antagonisms that are created as a result. Just look at what's happening in this country with regard to uh, people who have to travel in London in order to get to their jobs and those who don't. There's a clear class element to this. And this is as a result of choices, choices by the state. Uh, we need to be more attuned to these and we need a theory that allows ourselves uh, to be attuned to these and that is less attuned to the, to the relative primacy of profit-oriented market-mediated accumulation as a principle of social organizations. Less attuned to the ways in which these shape the overall pattern of constraints and opportunities in contemporary societies. And if you're less attuned to these, you're missing something. And to, 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 to retune ourselves to these, we have to bring in a healthy dose of, of neo-Marxist structural theory uh, around the state to, to, to bring class back into the analysis, to, to borrow a phrase. Uh, that's the main reason why this approach, I think, is, is, is better. There are other reasons as well, um, mostly because it's, it's a better way of understanding the mechanisms and modes of state intervention. Combining strategic relational concerns with neo-pluralism introduces very important our, our relational aspects to the concept of state capacity. It facilitates a framework for understanding the differentiation between what the great sociologist Michael Mann called despotic power and infrastructural power. So infrastructural power gives the state the capacity to 
uh, and this is Michael Mann's words, not mine, to penetrate society and organize social relations throughout its territory on the basis of political decisions. This is very different to despotic power, which can be measured most vividly, to quote the great man himself, in the ability of red queens to shout off with his head and have their whim gratified without further ado. Strategic relational concerns provide an understanding that these capacities are relational. They're relational because even when they meet no resistance, states are not omnicompetent. We can certainly see that in the context of the UK and what's going on in COVID at the moment. Every mode of intervention has its strengths and weaknesses. And, and the ways in which modes of intervention are chosen over others, I am arguing is ultimately ground in relations and relations are best understood through class analysis. So we have to be careful because if we look at the state as a set of social relations, we cannot see it as a mere reflection of class interests, to borrow the old chestnut, the economic committee of the bourgeoisie. The state instead should be seen as possessing relative autonomy, relative autonomy from different class interests, as what it does is it advocates the interests of capitalism rather than capitalists. Now this understanding facilitates a firmer grip on the necessary ensemble of social relations and productions and associated institutions that link society with the state that then best facilitate latecomer industrialization uh, in the context of Latin America most important uh, or, 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 or facilitate other kinds of uh, state intervention and models of political economy. This allows for a much more holistic view of the state and its form. Classical state theory, you know, elite theory and pluralism sees the state as, as, as a neutral arbiter, a neutral adjudicator between conflicting interests and groups. Now Karl Marx saw the state as controlling and suppressing the lower classes. The discipline of public policy, as wonderful as it is, looks at how the state achieves targeted goals but doesn't really understand the, why certain goals are being chosen over others. That's the job of politics. And that's, I think, what this theory is going to really help us get to grips with. Why are certain policies being pursued rather than others, rather than just looking at the efficacy of policy as a, resu as a result of some sort of uh, idea and reductive concept of rationality. Uh, so the state does all of these things. So the key question becomes, how does the state maintain loyalty to, its, to itself by its members? Now, the liberal tradition answers this in one particular way. Yeah, we can start with Hobbes, might is right, through to Locke, it's all about life, liberty, and property. We can go on to Rousseau and talk about the social contract and the general will. But a social contract presupposes the state because people must already have a strong consciousness of their membership of a social community. Yeah, in other words, uh, the individual member of bourgeois society is educated behind his back to the generality of his personal interests. Bourgeois society is forced against his will to become the true state of an absolute community. So this is a very Hegelian concept that kind of is sort of the end point, not the end point, but a key point in the liberal tradition, heavily critiqued by Marx when he says that the state wasn't a separate social body. It's the encapsulation of civil society. So we can't separate the state from civil society, they're the same thing because the state is formed from within the social relations that exist within civil society. And we can also say that it's quite clearly a material entity, it's a form of social organization, it's not a spiritual one as Hegel would kind of have us believe. Uh, so I'm going to skip a section because I noticed I'm running out of time. Um, but the overall implications of this are that a hegemonic accumulation strategy that is linked to the changing balance of forces between capital and labor, as modified from time to time by the influence of other class or non-class forces. So hegemonic politics uh, and policies associated with this acquire a particular content as the result of the exercise of power. Hegemony of a particular accumulation strategy can be seen as the product of domination. And this is where I link with Daliani's paper because she was talking about one particular form of domination uh, in a very interesting way. Uh, 
I would say that we can expand that analysis out. Yeah, we, we can, yes, we can absolutely look at domination through patriarchy, but we can also look at domination through class domination, relation, understood in a very relational sense. Uh, we can look at, uh, uh, as I said, the feminists, we can look at patriarchal domination. We could look at, particularly in the context of Latin America, ethnic domination and racial domination. Uh, Neo-pluralists would look at the vast array of resources and identities and interests across an array of different governance levels that form domination. What all of these approaches have in common is the rejection of state power being above society. Class power is anchored wholly in the economy or civil society. So state power then is in fact a mediated effect of the changing balance of all of these forces, class, party, status, gender, identity, interest, race, ethnicity, in any given scenario at any particular time can be and are important. So state power becomes an explanandum. The explanans is the strategic relational terrain that reflects and refracts mediated power grounded in a constantly changing balance of different forces, the state's relative autonomy. So we can use this framework, which I very briefly outlined and would be happy to go into in a lot more detail if people want to ask me about it, to look at the Macri administration of Argentina. So I'll talk for about five minutes, if I'm allowed to, Kim, uh, about Macri and how all of this stuff relates. So how it relates is we must understand what has come before in order to, and therefore to be able to think in terms of continuity and change and simultaneously in terms of who is benefiting from this policy. Because public policy is not an exercise in how states achieve targeted goals, but why one set of goals is chosen over another. And we can relate this, and I, I, the reason why I sort of lingered on a lot of this for any, any St. Mary's academics who are here, I'm really quite interested in developing a research project looking at COVID and the different public policy reactions to COVID and not simply looking at the efficacy of different policies based on some sort of false idea of the, uh, uh, the, 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 um, the non-biased nature of, of scientific knowledge, but rather that all choices are made for very specific political reasons, and if, uh, including hiding behind the science. And if we could use this theoretical framework for, for, for that, we can really get to grips with understanding why different states have adopted different policies. They don't have different sciences. Uh, they may, may very well have different communities. Yes, those communities have different fractions of class that have different power. And therefore, my hypothesis, I suppose, is that this translates into different kinds of policy. But there's a lot of work that needs to be done on that. I might be completely wrong. Uh, and I think this is, this is fertile ground for sort of a, a, an interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary research project. So I'd be very interested in speaking to anyone who's interested in, in developing that after this. So with this in mind, uh, we can think about sort of what happened in Argentina under Macri, what came before, and try and juxtapose those. This is a whole other talk, of course, but for very sort of quick summary purposes, Macri took over in December 2015. Uh, at the time, GDP was uh, growing at around 2.7%. Inflation was 26%. Unemployment was 9%. The primary fiscal deficit was 4.4% of GDP. The debt to GDP ratio was 54%. And the current account deficit was 2.4% of GDP. Uh, this was basically as a result of the previous mode of political economy, which was under Nestor, uh, Nestor de Kirchner, then Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner, uh, or Kirchnerismo, Kirchnerism, which had sort of four key planks, again, very briefly. In macroeconomic terms, it was about economic stability. It was about lowering debt. It was about having a fiscal surplus. This was to please the middle classes. It was about expanded welfare, increase, several increases in the minimum wage, significant increases in social security, significant increases in employment. This pleases the working classes. We had a broad developmental model of what's known as EOI, export-oriented industrialization, in essence to please domestic bourgeoisie and large agro-industrialists. Uh, it also had a specific relationship to transnational corporations and the mining sector. It basically embraced transnational capital, particularly in mining, with the big important exception of oil, which uh, EPF was renationalized 
uh, under Cristina Fernandez, which, which actually only brought Argentina into line with the majority of the world. There are very few countries out there that actually have a private oil industry. The UK is the sort of kind of famous example, but there aren't many more out there. So what Macri did when he came into, this was the situation that Macri inherited. Uh, he chose really interestingly not to completely change it up. He was, he was elected in essence, to put it crudely on a neoliberal ticket, but he didn't engage in neoliberal shock doctrine. There was some neoliberal shock doctrine, and I'll highlight this in a second, but there were significant elements of gradualism as well. So, you know, a, a, a pure public policy person might have problems explaining this, but this is very easily explained by a politics person, uh, particularly, I would argue, using the framework that I outlined in the first 15 minutes of my speech. This gradualist approach was combined with elements of shock therapy, and we really want to get to grips with that. We look at the process of institutionalization and the power relationships that underpin it. Why? Because it, because why was it sort of shock therapy and uh, gradualist approach? Because it was the best set of policies rationally pursued by the state? No, because there was a reprioritization of class interests, but in an historical institutional setting with different priorities. So he couldn't go full neoliberal because of this prior institutionalized setting and because of the nature of class interests and, and their relationships in Argentina at the time. He didn't want to pursue this recent Kirchnerismo neo-developmentalist paradigm because he wasn't representing those class interests, but he couldn't have a complete break away from it either. And we can only understand that in the context of this idea of the status of social relations. So what did he do? What happened rather under Macri? Well, inflation increased to 48%, largely because he withdrew subsidies from the poor in transport and in electricity, et cetera, leading to a significant increase in all of their bills. Debt increased to 90% of GDP, largely because he chose to pay off the Paris Club of Creditors and associated rentiers, uh, mostly situated in the US. Uh, I, he withdrew the subsidies because he wanted to balance the budget, and primary fiscal deficit was reduced to 2.5% of GDP. And also he, he, he paid off all of the debt because he wanted to stimulate FDI. So he, he wanted to normalize the Argentine economy to, to attract investment. This never happens though, uh, which led to a large sort of some of the macro problems that, that associated. Uh, in terms of welfare, he largely kept this in place. A really interesting element of continuity. Uh, he probably had to in the context of the fact that about a third of all children in the Gran Buenos Aires area are considered structurally poor, according to the um, Universidad Católica, the, the Catholic university in, in Buenos Aires. Uh, and because also, I would argue, because of the institutional legacies of what came before. Uh, he, rather than having an EOI-driven model, he had an FDI-driven development model, but this, this, never, this never happened. So we have very interesting elements, and I'll finish on this, very interesting elements of continuity and change. And we can only understand that continuity and change if we trace the class interests, what came before, and the institutionalization of different class interests from what came before in order to get to grips with what is happening now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. I've been making mad notes. I can't imagine how your students keep up. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I don't give this kind of paper to the students. <laughs> very interesting. I've had, learned a whole lot there. And thank you very much, Daliani, as well. Um, we, I don't know if we've got any questions. People are, oh, we do have a question. Here we go. From Michelle. <clears throat> okay, so Michelle asks, um, thank you, Zadiani. Sorry, I have to leave for another tutorial. Ah, oh, right. I was interested in your comments about the lack. Oh, it's gone. It's disappeared. Here we go. I was interested in your comments about the lack of personalization of the crisis of modernity in Brazil. And it made me wonder whether you think misogyny influenced attitudes to the rights in the UK too. Um, UK more personality based. Thatcherism, etc. We didn't have Churchillism, Wilson, Wilsonism. Then the right takes up the attack of the left via Blairism, etc. Very interesting paper. Thank you, Michelle. Did you did you get all of that, Daniani? 
I did. Could you just read the first bit again? She said the lack of personalized personalization of the crisis of modernity in Brazil. So I guess she's talking about the kind of per personality politics in terms of Thatcherism. Um, well, I think my point was the opposite, that it is quite personalized because it was very much directed against Dilma and um, Lula, the corruption scandals and everything. But to relate it to the UK, it's not my specialist subject, the UK. Um, I personally feel misogyny is far more of an issue in Latin America than it is in the UK. I don't think gender takes up nearly enough of the agenda, political agenda in this country. It's very rare that we specifically focus uh, on gender. And I think it's interesting, I read something last week about the furlough scheme that, you know, um, women who have been on maternity leave are the exception to it and they've had to change the law last minute to include them because they can't, for example, for the self-employment scheme, um, you know, submit their records for the last three years. So um, I definitely think that's more of an issue in Latin America, gender and misogyny and, and interests like this. And I think it just comes from the kind of Latin colonial heritage, the influence of the Catholic Church, and just the more kind of genderized culture here. I think it is an issue, but we don't talk about it as much. But then I'm not an expert in UK politics. So I hope I've answered her question correctly. I was just going to have to go off for another tutorial, but um, but we can, we, we, we're recording this so we can pass okay. it on. She can I eat she a little bit connected to that um, about the relation. I mean, women seem to like Bolsonaro from what you're telling us. I just wondered how women feel about Macri, Chris, because he's a good looking guy, let's face it. And he's, he doesn't have <laughs> like women, does he? So, and he also, he doesn't, from the very little that I know about him, he, um, he's not opposed to self, uh, to same sex marriage. So, I'm just wondering how that kind of misogyny plays out in Argentina. Uh, it, it plays out in very similar ways. Machismo and Marianismo are big things across Latin America in general. They certainly exist in Argentina. I guess, I guess women can't have liked Macri that much because he lost the election. <laughs> uh, he's no longer in power. He was, he was, he was kicked out last year. Um, so that probably goes for men as well. Um, I'm not aware of any sort of pro-female policies he introduced. Abortion was legalized in Argentina, but that happened in the last year of Cristina Fernandez's um, premiership, not under Macri. He didn't reverse it, and he probably could have done, particularly given the sort of, uh, what Guglielmo O'Donnell called sort of, sort of vertical democracy in Latin America. You know, presidents often rule by decree. They don't really need the legislature for a lot of things. So he could have probably reversed it without a legislative majority, but he didn't. Mm -hmm. um, so on that basis, you could say uh, there's certainly elements of, uh, of, of pro-women policies. Uh, I think there's a, there's, a there's a significant difference between being pro-women and being feminist, of course. Um, mm. uh, but yes, I mean, a lot of these uh, processes that, that, that uh, Daliani was interested in talking about in Brazil, obviously in different institutional and historical contexts, are, are happen as well in Argentina. It's, mm. it's a very misogynistic society like every Latin American society. Well, that's interesting because um, Zen actually got a question um, is saying how much influence do trends in Brazil have on the rest of the continent, which kind of feeds into what you're saying there. Yeah, so Brazil is the, uh, depending on how you measure it, the largest economy uh, in Latin America, um, the richest economy in Latin America. It has the biggest military as well. Uh, it, it, it considers itself the hegemon of Latin America. So on that basis, Brazil has massive influence on Argentina because of, uh, Brazil is Argentina's biggest trading partner. Right. So recession in Brazil creates all sorts of knock-on effects in Argentina in terms of the economy. Um, so they are incredibly important and, and, and intertwined uh, with regard to each other. This is one reason why you saw uh, relatively sluggish GDP growth in Argentina in the last couple of years of Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner's presidency, so we're talking 2013, 2014, because Brazil is in recession. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll leave yeah. it there. Well, we're going to have to actually leave. compare the two shifts to kind of more right-wing populist leaders occurring in both countries at a similar juncture, although, of course, Argentina's overturned this now. Didn't last long. Okay. <laughs> Brazil follows Argentina. Yeah, uh, yeah. 
<laughs> okay. Can I just ask a question on what you said? Um, I wouldn't say Brazilian women like Bolsonaro. I say conservative women do. There's huge opposition, you know, sustained opposition against him. I would say probably the majority of women in Brazil actually hate him. Um, Chris, from what you said, do you think Christina Kirchner was um, kind of celebrated by women or do you think she was more a female leader but didn't have a feminist agenda? Someone like, I know, Theresa May or Margaret Thatcher, who I don't think did anything for women. Well, she, she legalized abortion. Yeah. Uh, which was a big yes, thing. Yes, that's, that's a big achievement apart from that. Apart in general. from that. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, well um, the, actually, of, in Latin America, that's a huge thing because it's, you know, yes. it's only legal in about three countries in Latin America. Yes. And in Argentina, I mean, I could, I could possibly argue an even huger thing. Uh, but yeah, yeah Latin, you're absolutely yeah. right. In general, in Latin America, that is massive. Ma it is massive. It, it's it is, as like, massive as, as Ireland, yeah? Yeah. Uh, for all sorts of interesting reasons, not least associated with uh, yeah. the Catholic Church. Um, yes, uh, so she also, I would say feminists in general, did support Christina, uh, and she did, uh, for, for very sort of material reasons, she not only legalized abortion uh, in terms of the planets, uh, in terms of welfare, uh, she, she targeted women and children uh, so in ways well, that but, hadn't, yeah. happened, hadn't happened before. Yeah. For example, um, there was um, one plan, uh, plan Jefes y Jefas del Gar, uh, male and female heads of households. Mm -hmm. So they actually recognized that you could have a female head of household and that that female could be paid a welfare subsidy directly by the state mm -hmm. rather than just the male, uh, which is kind of what happened before. Now that plan was actually introduced, of course, by Duelle in 2002, but she kind of you know, she, she ran with it and she extended it in certain ways uh, and rec and carried on that recognition that, you know, in a, in, a, in a modern context, you can be a female head of household as well as there being male heads of household. So, so, so yes, I would say I, I don't, I haven't done any research on this. I haven't, I haven't uh, interviewed uh, women with this purpose of trying to understand this interesting question, but my relatively well educated guess would be would be yeah i mean I, I i have a couple of feminist argentine friends and they were fans of christina so you know on that purely anecdotal level good answer i wish we could carry on and uh, and talk some more but um we've come to the end of the webinar now um but i'd really like to thank um both of you thank you daliani and thank you very much chris um I think I've learned a huge amount again in just in one hour. So um, it's really appreciated you taking the time to, to um, talk to us about these, these really interesting subjects. Um, for our attendees out there, next week we have, um, we have Oslem Erden and Imogen Fell who are going to be talking about marginalised children, NGOs and refugees. Um, so um, please do log in um, next week for another another webinar, lunchtime webinar. In fact, it's 11 o'clock next, next week, so it's coffee time webinar rather than lunchtime webinar. But um, again, thank you very much to our speakers. Thanks and thank you, and Emmanuel, for setting up and everything. Yeah. Indeed. Okay, right. Bye-bye. Ha, ha, ha.